Uh, thank you. Thank you for the um, kind invitation to speak. Uh, respect the Ghana people, love this land. Um, so I'm a, uh, a, a clinical hematologist and, um, and basic scientist. Just a plug for any students that are in interested, we, we have a cancer journal club on Mondays, non-public holidays at 2.30, just upstairs on level four. Anyone's welcome to come. Uh, we have many students and postdocs, uh, and it's a fantastic time because the last 10 years is probably the most exciting time in oncology in the history of mankind, and it's just been so wonderful uh, to, to, to be part of this. Um, so a small map of, of my, my career. I've, I've really only lived in two two cities, um, Adelaide and, and San Francisco, but I uh, really love them both. Um, I guess a couple of things I will say. Number one, um, in Australia we're allowed to do pathology training at the same time as physicians, and that's incredibly transformative if you want to do you know, really good basic research. So there's a few training opportunities out there that still exist, and I hope we preserve them when you can actually do combined pathology, because in pathology you learn specificity, sensitivity, quality control, ROC curves, flow cytometry, molecular, and you don't learn that properly in medical school. And the second thing I would say, I was, you know, I'm old. Back in the day, Peter Solders and I had a, had a deep, the first three years of medical school at Adelaide Uni was hardcore biochemistry, pharmacology, and that, all of that led to me knowing what to do when I got to Stanford. So. I would argue, if I ever got to talk to Albanese, we need to preserve at least two medical schools in Australia that actually encourage basic, because we need basic science more than ever now, and we need clinicians to know how to implement it, and we've seen that with, uh, with COVID. So while I was a, an advanced, I didn't really know what I was doing as an advanced trainee, and, I, uh, and my mother owns a lot of land around a private hospital, and I was thinking of just being a a private consultant buying a yacht and sailing to Kangaroo Island. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but along, along, when, I was, when I was on the wards, uh, on the transplant ward, just as a junior haematologist, um, Tim Hughes was, was, was one of my bosses, uh, I looked after the son of my mother's best friend. His, uh, he, was a, he was an outstanding cricketer in, in Adelaide, in South Australia. His father, remained unnamed, was a decorated barrister, and under my care, he developed this terrible fungal infection after a honeymoon, and he died before we could get his brother's transplant. And I went to the funeral. And his father looked me in the eye after the funeral and said, Dan, you've got education, and you've got some talent. You need to do something about this. And he didn't realize it was like a, some kind of higher being was speaking through his voice to my heart. And now I knew exactly what I, what I needed to do. Um, uh, I also won't comment about uh, when I was appointed to junior faculty at Stanford, um, a certain president of the United States made it very difficult for my wife uh, to work and get a visa over there, but we won't, we won't, we won't talk about the hard part. <laughs> um, this is where we, I lived for about seven years uh, just before COVID. Um, I put we work in brackets because I don't believe they've been very, very successful. But what's really unusual about this place is there's no skyscrapers. There's just beautiful gardens. It's a place to walk and dream and dream big. Um, and you just can't believe that such a quiet place is so productive. It's very similar to Adelaide in terms of gardening, um, uh, beautiful parks, uh, beautiful places to, to, to work. And I learned a lot from the... oh. Sorry about the slide. Um, so this is my direct mentor. This is my indirect mentor, Irv Weissman. Aravi is now the director of the Stem Cell Institute at, at Stanford. And I really learned an incredible amount of, from these guys. The first thing is they don't have a shame, they don't have a failure shame culture. And that's partly what I, I think I learned because I was always afraid of doing the wrong thing on the war. I didn't want uh, the consultant to, to shout at me for doing the wrong thing. Um, but one strength of Silicon Valley, most startups are fifth failures before success. They're, these guys, what I couldn't, and, and many Nobel Prize, Prize winners I could list at Stanford that I got to know, um, they still only get 10% of their grants and only 10% of their papers are ever accepted. But their contribution to medicine is just off the scale. And the secret is they don't worry about failure. Um, the second thing they told me, at all costs, love the truth. 
Only the truth is congruent with the truth. If something's real, it'll continue to be real on a bad Monday, and that's what you want to go for. Uh, and, and, and thirdly, help your people, build them up, build good teams, um, and the rest, is, the rest is history. So my lab is more just to the left, towards a bit basic, and I like it, like, but we need both. Um, I'm just so thankful for the epidemiologists across the states, including South Australia, and our COVID response. But without this, we wouldn't have had an RNA vaccination. You need both. Um, and I just remind the, the medical students and clinicians, we, in our training uh, as doctors and, and, and allied health, we're, we're really trained to be masters of what is known for sure and know the textbook and the protocol. But research is you're learning to walk into an unknown area and stretch, stretch the boundary out. And that, that's quite a different way of thinking. Uh, but we need to learn to do both. Um, so my lab's focus on, on, on improving precision outcomes for cancer. Many of you may have had family members uh, or friends who have had cancer, and, and, and it's not uncommon for people to get their tumours sequenced now, and you'll get a report back. You can get it done through clinical trials, you can get it done cheaply at SF Pathology, you can get it done from Foundation One or, or, or other, other private companies. And we are just beginning to learn how to read these reports and what to do with them. You know, is there something out there that if you knew matched these particular mutations in your cancer and you got onto that right thing, you'd be cured? That's the kind of thing I'm interested in. Uh, at the moment, even though we do a lot of next-gen sequencing for cancers, I would argue about only about 85, less, less than 15% of mutations are actually druggable with something that might work a little bit. Um, so my lab is dedicated to pushing the boundaries and, and seeing are there, are there things out there that we wouldn't otherwise, cl clinicians may not otherwise think of that can make a tumour disappear um, that's not necessarily considered a druggable target. And I'll show you some examples and it's, oh, it's, just, it's, really, it's really exciting. Um, so my lab uses mass spec, bioinformatics and, 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 um, and gene um, um, genetic screens to try to find, it's a bit, little bit like you might have seen recently in the, in, the, uh, in the conflict in Ukraine, there are often hidden vulnerabilities in something that looks incredibly intimidating. There are hidden vulnerabilities that if you're able to put that in the right stress uh, stressful uh, environment, you can actually expose something that that cancer actually can't do. When you find that, you find gold. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, so I, I mainly work on the blood cancers because these two guys, for example, um, almost all of the mutations that we get from the sequence and we know are truly producing the cancer. Does that make sense? They're the true driver and they're recurrent. So if you build a drug or something against it, it will work for the next patient. Um, unfortunately, not all the solid cancers are like that. So you can have more than 500 mutations in a smoking lung cancer. You don't know which one's doing the work, plus all the chromosomes are scrambled. You don't know if they're perhaps driving it. But these guys are pretty clean, so it's a beginning for precision medicine. The ones in red, I have a, um, a drug development target program uh, active at the moment to varying degrees of success. And I'll show you some examples uh, that have really been exciting, some vignettes, and we'll talk about um, uh, ways to enable research. Um, so while I did my PhD, I had the privilege of working with John Dick, and he's the guy that first discovered the cancer stem cell. Incredible. He'll probably get a Nobel Prize very soon. Incredible uh, um, um, scientist. And what he showed is turning out to be true, that in most people's cancers, not every cell is the same. There's subclones, there's different shapes. One's passing on some food to another. There's monocytes there. There's all this heterogeneity that we're not very good at understanding. We're just beginning to, to understand. But we developed the first monoclonal antibody to a cancer stem cell in the world and went into clinical trial on its own as an antibody. It wasn't effective enough, but that experience just taught me so much about drug development and working with industry and, and phase one, two clinical trials. Um, so the first thing I did at Stanford is we developed an algorithm um, to show that many, uh, many of the common mutations in cancer all have their own epigenetic patterns. Some of you may, may realise that on top of DNA, there's actually things that can be put on, on there, such as methylation, and, and many, and imprinting uh, works through this. There's maternal imprinting in the zygote. Epigenetics is extremely powerful and probably, probably um, 
um, is responsible for driving certain sections of autism. And the good, things, the good thing about epigenetics in cancer is you, it can actually turn these things off with both drugs and sometimes with diet. Um, so we were able to show that by turning off um, certain epigenetic genes associated with the WH1 mutation, for example, we can make these cancer cells mature and then uh, and disappear and they are less, less aggressive. And then we, we use the same sort of algorithm to find what's called synthetic lethal targets. This is how a lot of new breast cancer therapy works. But basically, if you can imagine a cancer cell, it has this mutation here in gene B. If you're lucky enough, you can find a drug that blocks a good gene, such as gene A, that that cancer mutation really, really needs, especially to make that tumour grow. It's a bit like a burglar needs, let's say he's going to go rob a house, burglar's evil, <laughs> but he needs a nice coffee, otherwise he doesn't have the motivation. He, um, so here, gene, gene Y is not deleted, but it's amplified every time mutation X is present in that cancer. So that bad mutation actually needs this good gene Y to get its job done. And if you can find this, you're finding gold, because if gene Y is an enzyme that's not, if, not needed by the liver, then you can drug it. We found 145,000 for 3,000 mutations across 12 different cancers. We've validated four, we've only had time, and they all work, and it's fantastic. One of the best ones, um, this is unpublished, but it's, but it's yeah, just incredible. We found an unusual solid cancer with the IDH1 mutation that doesn't use Warburg PET scan positive glucose to grow, but it actually incorporates fatty acids and it also builds its own fatty acids. So it's completely addicted to fat to grow. And the, it burns that fat to make up for an NADH deficit it has. Um, so you can see here, if you knock out this gene here, ACC1, it's the most important gene in your body to build fat from scratch. If you knock that out, in the mice models and on plate colonies, these cells just can't grow. And I, have, I haven't got time to show you, but if you put all of these tumours on fatty-free diet with high sucrose, the tumours can't grow. Um, and along the way, we tried to develop some better humanised um, uh, models, what we call um, patient avatars. Uh, this is a bone marrow uh, on the back of a mouse where we can plant the, the tumour from the patient sample and grow it indefinitely. And this has been extremely powerful for engrafting um, very rare tumours that no one has a preclinical model. And then you can test your drug and see, oh, wow, it actually works well in a human micro microenvironment in the, back of, uh, in the back of mouse. And we're doing some uh, lots of exciting, innovative work in making these, these ossicles uh, more consistent and, and, and faster right here at... Uh, um, recently, we've come up with a monoclonal anti for, for the most common, second most common mutation, myelofibrosis. Myelofibrosis is a terrible crippling disease. It feels like long COVID. You get bone pain, fever, fatigue. There's no known curative therapy. Um, but 70% of the non-JAK2 cases have this weird CalR mutation that makes a new peptide at the end of a gene. Can you see that red? So it's what you call a neoepitope. Neo, neo we made a monoclonal against that, and lo and behold, all of the cells with the mutation can't grow, and we can, uh, we can remove the tumour from the bone marrow and the peripheral blood of mice uh, with these cancers. And we've just humanised this, and it will start hopefully in five months as, uh, as a um, national clinical trial for patients with uh, myelofibrosis in, in Australia. Uh, another exciting discovery we only made about five months ago is cancers with a TEP2 mutation. It's a very common mutation in cancer. If you treat these with high dose of scorbate, ascorbate is vitamin, you know your mum always said have some vitamin C. It's really, it actually is quite healthy. For, so uh, ascorbate is needed as a cofactor for the TET2 enzyme. And these cancers have lost that, that function. Um, but when you, when you give um, uh, animal models of these cancers high dose of scorbate, you can actually restore um, the epigenetic 5-hydroxymethyl cell um, abundance throughout the genome and you can change the differentiation properties. So we have clinical trial active right now. Um, it's open label. I can tell you some of the results are extremely exciting. We have one patient with 11 months in remission and he had high dose. Um, he was on the um, RAS arm and we have other patients on the, on the TET2 arm. So this is the first molecularly informed precision trial for a rare cancer. Uh, chronic myeloid leukemia. So world view is very important. Um, physician, we're taught fear of failure. Get it right. Scientists, you have to learn, 
you have to learn to learn from failure because most of the time all your ideas fail. Um, position, you, you learn to be risk averse, you anticipate what can go wrong. Scientists, you have to learn to actually take a risk sometimes and be prepared to stand up and be wrong. And that takes guts. Position, we're good at, really good at multitasking and we need that here as well, but you also need to learn just to focus. And am I going to wake, am I committed in the next two weeks to wake up every morning and think about the same idea because I know it's, the way I'm doing it isn't working. Position, we value orthodoxy, we follow protocols. We don't like people who challenge us. Scientists, you value, value heterodoxy, like Irv Weissman says, discovery is the enemy of orthodoxy. The lady who discovered CRISPR couldn't get a grant for 12 years, Berkeley. Um, a physician looks at the evidence in the patient and tries to work out what's going on. Scientist first thinks creatively and then begins to see that the evidence lines up in his hypothesis. One, thing, one great thing John Dick taught me when I got to work with him in my PhD is true science is not seen. It's something you do in your guts. And then over time you'll see it work out in the evidence. So true science is actually not seen first. AI can't do science. Robots can't do science. Um, it sounds strange what I'm telling you, but it's, but it's the truth. Um, Doctors, we have short bursts of adrenaline on a met call, then we relax. Scientists, it's a slow burn. It's a long marathon. Most of Helen Marshall's work is, a, you know, that's a 25-year work. Um, it takes your whole life, but boy, it's worth it. Um, physicians, we're taught binary thinking. We exclude that disease. We exclude this disease. We exclude, well, then it could be that. Scientists, you need to use associative thinking. Most of the things I've showed you are complete. Everything I've shown you today is serendipitous to what we were actually trying to do. But if, I had, if we hadn't noticed the unusual thing, we wouldn't have followed it down, down that path. Barriers, this is hard to say, but as doctors, we're, we're taught to order people around. Real research is actually doing a tedious task and accepting the glory of humility. Financial security, I, you know, I went to Stanford seven years, I loved it, learned a lot, but I missed out on nine million estimated of private practice income for chemotherapy. But would I change my life? Not, a, not in a second. Um, burnout, you don't, don't say yes to everything so that you can do what really matters. Time management, you learn that well as doctors. And we beat some of the basic scientists on that in my opinion. Um, writing, we're not taught how to write clearly and scientifically in medical school. But that's, pr even if you just learnt that, and you align yourself with a basic scientist here in Adelaide, you could probably accomplish a, a lot. Um, so I, uh, I might leave it. So the ones in pink are um, new interventions that have come about from, from our own research program that were not available or known about uh, um, before. Cancer precision medicine has only just begun. The future is bright. Here's some questions from our research. When I read a sequencing report, What's the main driver mutation? Are there resistance mutations? Who came first? Is the DNA damage repair pathway intact? Is there likely to be epigenetic patterns going on? Most importantly, are there synthetic lethal targets or neopitopes that we could give in immunotherapy? So there's so many new cancer therapeutics on the way. We've only just touched the tip of the iceberg. I want to thank my lab and all of our collaborators and funding sources, and most of all, um, the patients who generously consent to uh, letting us have their uh, um, some of their blood samples.